Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, First Order of Business. Thank you so much to the subscribers. I appreciate that so much. And if you haven't subscribed, please push that like button and ring that subscribe bell and you'll be notified when I upload a video. Today we're going to be talking about the continuing saga of Ghislaine Maxwell, that's the alleged madam for Jeffrey Epstein. And there was a tranche of documents that were released on January 27th of this year. It's been a slow drip drip of documents that have been unsealed in the civil case. It was a, civil, a settled civil case between Virginia L. Roberts Giffray against Ghislaine Maxwell. It was a defamation suit. It was settled. It was contentious. And what happened was the affidavits and the depositions and all those things were under seal. And the Miami Herald was very dogged in going after getting after the court to get these documents unsealed so that we, the public, Joe Public, can know what people said, what they saw, what happened. Because she was alleged to have been a co-conspirator with Jeffrey Epstein in the alleged sex trafficking. So we have a public interest to know what went down. What I'm going to be talking about in this entire video, other than the facts as I read from the court files, is my opinion. Speculation and opinions are not facts, so the interested viewer is, is encouraged um, to do their own research. So let's get into it. January 27th, the tranche of documents is unsealed. Many documents in this settled civil case. And what happens is in a normal case, you have depositions taken, you have affidavits and the like. And if you have a witness and that witness doesn't answer the question, refuses to answer, or say they have an attorney and the attorney instructs them not to answer, the person that's the movement, the person that's deposing them can ask the court to force the witness to answer. So that usually they take it up before a judge and that's what happened after Ghislaine's first depo by Boys, Schiller, and Macaulay. That's the folks that are representing Virginia Roberts Chiffre. And Ghislaine Maxwell's typically represented by Laura Menninger and someone, and I might mispronounce this name, I think it's Pagliuca. And so the first deposition was combative, allegedly, and she refused to answer most of the questions, a whole bunch of questions, and so it went before a judge, and she was instructed to answer certain types of questions, and that's where we get our second deposition that we're going to be talking about today. It's pretty much a, a slew of questions and avenues to go down of things she didn't answer in the first deposition. So you got to think, these are touchier topics, and... Still, the document as released is about 50% redacted. People are still being protected. She is still being protected. Her privacy with other adults that don't involve children, involving Epstein, seemingly um, being protected. Some of the names, of course, are still protected. So I think that there'll still be drip, drip, drips of releases and maybe more redactions, but that's just my speculation. So the first document I'm going to be reviewing for you is Exhibit D. And this is, again, Ghislaine Maxwell's second deposition in the settled civil lawsuit. It happened on July 22nd, 2016. So keep in mind, that's fi about five years ago from now, give or take. And it went down in New York at the office of Boys, Schiller, and Flexner. Uh, David Boyce was asking the questions that day. Laura Menninger is one of the attorneys that was representing Maxwell. I believe Pagliuca was the one that was advising her mostly that day. There was a whole bunch of attorneys in the room, according to the deposition. Now, you, you look at the deposition, and it's got the, the laundry list of all the attorneys representing all the different parties, and then you have redaction. So i got to say, you have to go to page 8 to get to any commentary, anything to look at. Let's get into it. Boyce asks Maxwell, 
Were you ever on a plane with Mr. Epstein when Mr. Epstein had sex with anyone? Now, the answer she gives to this set of questions, because he has to ask it many different ways and there's lots of um, objections. She, in my opinion, gives very glib answers. Not that I recall. And how would I know? All in all, he gets out of her that she denies seeing Epstein receiving oral on the plane. I want you to make a, a note that some of these things that are asked could very very well be answered yes or no, but you get a lot of the qualifying like, well, not that I recall, not that I remember. It's not a no, It's and, it, and it's not a necessarily a lie. It's a, I don't recall, I don't remember. There's a whole heavy sprinkling of that throughout this whole thing. Now, in my mind, if someone's getting OR, oral on a plane, you're going to remember it. It's not something you're going to be like, mm, not that I don't recall, unless it was something that you did all the time. Like you could ask me, when was the last time you had pizza? Or when was the last time you had steak? And you could be like, mm, you know, you've had it so much and it's such a common thing, you might not recall the exact date. But you could say, like, when was the last time you went to Mount Everest? You would recall that. It wouldn't be something you'd see all the time. So to preface all this, this whole deposition with this kind of stuff, to be not sure and not being able to recall for something so crazy as seeing Epstein having sex with someone on a plane or not seeing them or not recalling is, is quite disturbing to me. But she does say she denies seeing Epstein getting oral on the plane. All right. She's then shown a list. It's Exhibit 26. And other, and I believe, in my opinion, this is speculation, that's a list of the victims. And other than Virginia and one other redacted name that's not released to the public yet, Maxwell denies knowing any of these people on the list. All right? She says, I do not know them. I do not recall the names. So, I don't know them and I don't recall. Common theme, don't recall. Then Ghislaine went on to admit seeing someone give Epstein a massage at his home in Palm Beach. I gotta say, of course you did, by the way. Of course you did. And also admits to seeing someone give him a massage to Jeffrey in the Virgin Islands. And this is what they get out of her. Quote, I think when Mr. Epstein received massages, he never had clothes on. Fair enough. When most people get a full professional massage they won't have their clothes on or they'll just have their bottoms on and they'll have a sheet. Maxwell claims to have received a professional massage in Epstein's residences in Palm Beach, New Mexico, Paris, and the Virgin Islands. She was asked about her own professional responsibilities for Epstein, like scouting for Epstein essentially, and she says, quote, part of my professional responsibilities, dot, 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 I go to spas and other professional areas and receive massages from people in these places. And if I felt that person was good or had a good massage, I'd ask them if they did home visits, dot, dot, dot. People come to the house in that capacity. So that was how she explained his questions about, say, scouting for the massages. So keep that in mind. Due to this response, ba boys basically, and I'm paraphrasing, asks Maxwell if she test drives all the professional masseuses that she refers to Epstein, right? Because she's going to go out, she's going to see if they're good, and if they're good, she's going to ask if they'll come to the house. And so she's, I, in my opinion, I feel like she feels that maybe she's getting boxed in with this question, because if, if it's one way, that's not good, and if it's the other way, it's not good. So she says typically yes, but that wasn't exclusively. So then David Boyce asks, and this is paraphrased, was every person who you arranged to come to Jeff, Mr. Epstein's house someone who you either got a massage from or came recommended by a friend? And I think she, she pretty much agreed to that. And so then, because she was trying to make it out like, she wasn't going and getting schoolgirls. She wasn't, she was denying everything having to do with picking people that weren't professionals, you know, say like people off the street. She was 
saying that she got professional massages and if they were good, she would ask the people to come to the house. Or she was getting referrals from say like a friend that said, oh, I had a great massage. Oh yeah, give me the name. Those are the only two ways she admitted to bringing people to Epstein's residences for massages. He asks her, and this is paraphrased, were any of the people under the age of 21? And she says, I can't say that I know. I know Virginia has obviously made those claims that, and she was 17 when he met her, but other than her, I can't think of anybody. So you're scouting for people, right? And you're bringing them back and you're getting referrals, right? And you're bringing them over to Epstein. You're like, in my opinion, you're like a Renfield for Dracula. And now you're admitting or you're saying that, that you don't know their ages. Okay. And that maybe that Virginia was under 17. She admitted it there. So is that an anomaly? Are we, are we to believe that's an anomaly? That's my question. Maxwell then claimed she didn't know Virginia's age at that time. So I, I gotta ask, did she not ask people their ages? Or did she ask them their ages? She says, quote, I barely remember her at all. That's being Virginia. Basically, she didn't make a very strong and lasting impression. No, ma'am. No, ma'am, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that. In my opinion, that's an insult. That's an, <laughs> that's an insult. To say that another human being didn't leave a strong and lasting impression, referring to Virginia, okay? Almost likening her to being someone who handed you a, wa a water at a restaurant. Just some inconsequential, insignificant person who just flitted and flitted out, flitted in and flittered out of your life and you can't remember them to save your life. They left you no strong and lasting impression. That to me is a backhanded insult to think that she went and got, in my opinion, Virginia from Mar-a-Lago. She went and recruited girls, okay, in my opinion. She brought Virginia to her own pad in, was it England, Paris, and had Prince Andrew there? No, ma'am. You don't get to do that. You don't get to do that. So then Maxwell also claims that when she was with Epstein, he only received one massage per day. So in my opinion, she's dialing down with the three massages per day that, you know, he had this need for three, you know, uh, how would you put it, releases a day and that he only really got one a day. Well, that, like, like that makes it better, but I digress. When boys asked her about where she met Virginia, okay, she said, quote, it was at Mar-a-Lago. So Maxwell, she lures Virginia away from her legitimate job at Mar-a-Lago. Note that. Note that for the record, guys. This is what she said. I believe today that she was a masseuse working at Mar-a-Lago and she was 17 years old. Maxwell then said, and this is paraphrased, she doesn't remember first meeting Virginia. She doesn't remember how it went down. She doesn't remember how Virginia came to give Epstein a massage. Maxwell just remembers speaking to Virginia's mother. So I believe the reason that Ghislaine decides to pick at that and say, I don't remember anything but that, is because I think Virginia said her father dropped her off and it might have been her mother. And so therefore, Ghislaine seized on that one thing that she could prove was wrong in her mind. <laughs> I just want to note that in this depot, there's about 50% redactions. So I'm gonna hop around because there's huge chunks of redactions between the questions. The next set of questions, a name named Joanna or Johanna is not redacted. And also there is later a, I believe it's a deposition in the composite depositions and her name is, is not redacted. So it's asking about her giving both Epstein and Maxwell a massage. And Maxwell's ask as to who paid Johanna, because you know, Johanna is giving both Maxwell and Epstein a massage, a massage. And she says she didn't know who paid her. So then there's more to redactions and then Maxwell's shown exhibit 27. Boyce asks Maxwell about a redacted person who spoke to Maxwell 
about the women Maxwell believed Mr. Epstein had sex with. So it's kind of hearsay, but it's kind of a gossipy question, you know, that, say, person X spoke to you about all the women Jeffrey was having sex with. So one of the girls discussed was at Epstein's property in New Mexico. All right, now you're gonna find out later, and since these people have gone public, you can easily put two and two together. And in my speculation, they're talking about maybe Annie Farmer. And they're also venturing into the topic that Epstein also had a ring or sex girls and were bringing girls, underage girls, to New Mexico. That also gets on the record because then there's going to be other questions about that that will come out in other deposition. So you got to think that David Boyce likely already has the depositions and he knows certain things already and that's why he's asking her these questions and in the first deposition she wouldn't answer any of those questions and now she's being forced to answer them and we're getting little dribs and drabs of that coming out but the rest is still redacted. Okay, makes makes sense, clear as mud, okay. All right, so there's many breaks, like physical breaks where they take a break, the attorneys ask for a break, they ask for a rest, restroom break or a lunch break or whatever, right? But the breaks, if you read along, the breaks are so coincidental to where things are getting sticky that Boyes seems to think that every time Peg Lucia um, is taking his breaks, he's talking to his client. And even when they get back on the record at one point, Ghislaine says, yeah, I was talking to my attorney, uh, paraphrased. And so he pretty much, I would say he implies that the attorney was requesting bathroom breaks in order to coach Maxwell, but he pretty much says that he's doing that. And then they get into, you know, a verbal spat battle. Uh, it's, you know what, like I've read a lot of depositions where they're, it's contentious and the attorneys do go at it. So it isn't actually the worst one I've ever see, seen at all, but it, it's interesting. So they go back on the record and Maxwell's asked about Exhibit 27, wherein there's this Daily Beast article and there's three on the record stories of a mother and her two daughters who came from Phoenix, Arizona and they're talking about their experiences with Epstein and Ghislaine, allegedly. And now we know from them coming forward in the public that who they are. So now we know who, who's in the article that they're showing Ghislaine. It says the oldest was an artist and the youngest was 16. The Daily Beast reported that both daughters were seduced by Epstein. Allegedly, we now know that they are Maria Farmer and Annie Farmer. I just want to say, you know, gosh, my sympathies go out to the victims. All right. So after being shown this Daily Beast article, suddenly Maxwell remembers seeing these girls. So remember seeing Maria Farmer at Epstein's house. So it, it significantly refreshed her memory regarding some of the people she knew. And she said, quote, I believe I met her in New York, met her, and then she also met the sister in New Mexico. So that'd be, she met Maria in New York and she met Annie in New Mexico. And Ghislaine admitted she and Jeffrey Epstein went to, went to Ohio for business. All right, so let's get into what that business is, because if you know Maria Farmer's testimony, you're going to be like, we're going there, right? We're, we're going there. And Maxwell admits she stayed at his house, that being Maria. Yeah, I think redacted, that'd be Maria in my opinion. I think Maria was painting or something in Ohio, and he let her stay at a place that he had. Allegedly, this Columbus, Ohio property was owned by Les Wexner, Leslie Wexner. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, he asks about that. He doesn't say, at least if he does, it's redacted. He, you know, he queries her about the ownership of the property. And she says it was a property that he, being Jeffrey Epstein, had that she stayed at. And then later on, she equivocates and says she doesn't know if he rented it or leased it or whatever, but that Jeffrey had put her there. So she kind of pulls less away from the center of attention, but you've got to know that Maria was quite emphatic that that was Les Wexner's property that she, that she was staying at and later felt trapped at. It's speculation, that's what she said. So then David Boyce asks, did she call the police or threaten to call the police because of anything either you or Mr. Epstein did? You know what Maxwell said to that? I never heard that. Okay, 
Has someone ever called the police on you? Has someone ever threatened to call the police on you? Would you remember it for the rest of your life? Yes. So it's either yes or no. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around some, I, I just don't recall. I mean, is that an everyday, I would have been like, is that an everyday occurrence that people call the police on you? I mean, you either did either, she either threatened you or not. She either said threatened you were gonna, she's gonna call the police or not. I mean, when asked about her own knowledge of massage, you know, her own techniques, Maxwell admits to knowing how to massage about pressure points in the hands and the feet, but she doesn't recall if she ever showed people, like if she ever demonstrated it on people. Note, many victims have also claimed that Maxwell showed them physically how to massage Epstein, like how he liked his feet massaged and stuff, focusing on the feet. Virginia said that Maxwell demonstrated it, showed her how he liked it best. So, yeah, I mean, they were delving into that and she tried to backtrack. At first, reading it, she was proud of her knowledge and then she backtracked and said that she never gave, like, you know, demonstrations. She demonstrated it, but she didn't show anybody, which it's, it doesn't make any sense. David Boyce then asked Ghislaine about around the time that Jeffrey got arrested for the first offense and the police report that was generated from it and, and pretty much asked her, like, did you ever talk to him about the veracity, you know, of that report? Did, did you ever discuss with him whether that police report purporting that he did these things to underage girls, you know, was that accurate? And you know what she says to that? That she never discussed the police report with Jeffrey Epstein, whether it was accurate or not. Now, in a way I could understand, like if you have a friend and that friend is accused of something, that you're not gonna be pulling out the police report like their attorney and cross-questioning them on every little element of it. But you sure as hell would be like, did you do that? Like you did that? Tell, tell me, I'm, I'm hearing this on the news because she claims she heard it on the news like everybody else. I'd be like, excuse me, did you really do that? The, the totality of the accusation <laughs> would be discussed. And to say, like, you never discussed it, is that, okay, if you did something with someone, then you wouldn't necessarily have to discuss it because you would know what the answer would be, right? I, I just find that to be beyond the pale. So Maxwell answers, I don't believe I have. I haven't spoke to him. No, I don't think so. Well, in retrospect, I believe that documents show that there were emails uh, between them after this that she alleged that she didn't, so... Then she's shown Exhibit 28, a list of names. I speculate that these names were the names from the address book. And when I say address book, I don't mean a physical address book. I believe it was all contained on a computer and it was a printed out list that had, you know, the name, the address, it had the phone number for every, you know, place they had, every vehicle, if they had phones in the car, their cell phone, their pager. Yeah, they had pagers back then. Um, everything or landline and they would have it all printed out and they had it broken i've seen that it was released i've seen it and depending they would have like the all the masseuses broke out into one area and they'd have like all the people in paris in one area and another address book uh, had it more there were more socialites and stuff like that so she's shown what i believe is this list and of course she chip chipperly states, oh, I believe I've met pretty much everybody on this list. Yeah, you would, right? It's all the like A-listers and stuff. Yet Maxwell denies knowing any of the people on the list that I think it's the ones that receive massages. So she's like, ah, you know, only knows like maybe one or two. And those are the people that are pretty much suing. But then the list of the A-listers like should be like, knows, oh, I know everybody on that list. When she's shown this exhibit 28, I want to note that she does offer that one of the people on the list was Epstein's girlfriend in the 1980s and part of the 1990s. And note, wasn't there also uh, an email that came out in the last couple of years from this time frame with allegedly Maxwell asking Epstein, like saying, paraphrase, it would be great if you would admit that so-and-so was your girlfriend, like tell everybody that so-and-so was your girlfriend during this time period. 
Now, I don't know if that means that she was his girlfriend during a certain time period. And she's like, you know, that would help if you just said, told everybody you, you were dating her at a certain time period of this. Or if she, if it wasn't true and she was just saying, it'd be great if you told him that. But I thought that was interesting because I remember that email came out and I was like, boys then asked Maxwell, did you ever tell anybody that Mr. Epstein was a scout for Victoria's Secret? And her answer was, I don't recall saying that. Did you ever tell anyone that Mr. Epstein could get them a job with Victoria's Secret? Not at the regular mall, at, at, with Victoria's Secret. And she says, no, nah, I don't recall. Again, <laughs> guys, is that something you would do all the time that you couldn't recall? If you know it's not in your nature to say that, you would say no. Right? So that leads me to believe that if you just don't recall, that must be something that you think is a possibility you could have done. Otherwise, you would have said no, right? Again, there are people that have alleged that that is how they got lured over there. These young girls, some of them alleged that they were lured under under the guise of becoming a Victoria's Secret model. That's sad. On the end of her working relationship with Epstein, she says, quote, I cease to be happy in the job and I cease to be happy spending time with Mr. Epstein. He became more difficult to work with. There's more redactions. And then she said that she was asked about when he was getting massages in the Virgin Islands and how he came about getting the masseuses and Epstein, she said, would receive his massages in the master cabana. But she denied arranging those massages for him. She said that those masseuses came from St. Thomas. So, but she claimed that the, the people, that the massage him came from St. Thomas and that she didn't have anything to do with arranging those at the island, that whoever was the property manager at the island would take care of that for, for him. Then... Now I'm gonna remember this question and answer set because it's gonna it's going to tie back to another um, very disturbing deposition. Question: Do you recall being at Redacted? And I think the Redacted is the re residence of the Dubins, so keep that in mind. Do you recall being at Blank? And there was a girl that was crying and very distraught. Answer: I've never seen that. And there's redactions. We're going to tie back around to that one, all right? Question. Did you ever take the passport of any person who had told you that Mr. Epstein had demanded sex of them? No. So see, she came up with the answer to that. She didn't say, I don't recall. She said no. So that'll tie back into the next document. Note, they do get around to asking a bunch of questions about Alan Dershowitz because his name was also unsealed and allegedly he's happy his name is unsealed or so he says. So we can see what they asked Ghislaine and how she, how she answered about old Dersh. She asked at which properties that she saw Dershowitz and what conversations they had and she said that she saw him at the Virgin Islands and um, that they had a discussion about metal detecting because she was metal detecting and they discussed it. And that's pretty much all she said about Dershowitz. She didn't know of anything shady having to do with him. And regarding the people inquired about, Maxwell only claimed she knew about Epstein having sexual relationship with three people, all right? Now, I'm not saying that in his lifetime that's what she was saying, but about the people that were being inquired about in this deposition, she only claimed to know about him, him having sex with three people and all those names are redacted, all right? So Maxwell also claimed she only found out about the allegations against Jeffrey from the papers, like from the news in 2005, just like everybody else. So there was a question. In 2005, were you aware of any effort to destroy records of messages you had taken of women who had called Mr. Epstein in the prior period. And I think this is regarding the trash polls and also the taking of the, quote, black book, which is just the, the list of names of girls who would give massages the contacts, okay? That's what I think that's about, but it's not sure. 
So were you aware of any effort to destroy records or messages that you had taken of women who had called Mr. Epstein in the prior period and she was instructed multiple times not to answer the question? I believe she was shown the messages of the phone log that were printed out. All right, remember when I told you to keep in mind that set of questions that we would come back to? Let's come back to it. The next item I'm going to look at is a deposition. It was given on June 10th, 2016, so think about five years ago, by Rinaldo Rizzo. And we're going to queue it up to page 17. You can find this document in the composite depositions in the Virginia Jufre versus Ghislaine Maxwell case. All right. I'm going to read this right from the record. And I'm going to just say objection whenever there's an objection. There's plenty of them. And I'm not going to tell you it's foundational or whatever. But otherwise, I'm going to read this. And it jumps right into it because it's a composite deposition. All right. Question. How old was this girl? Answer. 15 years old. Question. What happens next when Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein and a 15-year-old girl walk into Eva Anderson's home? That's Eva Anderson Dubin, by the way. Objection. Answer. They proceed into the dining room area, which is across from the living room area. I go into the kitchen and I hear a conversation start. Very muffled. I could not hear any particulars about the conversation whatsoever. My wife and I are in the kitchen preparing the evening meal. Eva brings the young girl into the kitchen. In the kitchen, there's an island with three bar stools. Eva instructs the girl to sit in the furthest bar stool on the right. Question. Describe for me what the girl looked like, including her demeanor and anything else you remember about her when she walks into the kitchen. Answer. Very attractive. Very beautiful young girl. Makeup, very put together, casual dress. But she seemed very upset, maybe distraught. And she was shaking. And as she sat down, she sat down and sat in the stool exactly the way the girls I mentioned to you sat at Jeffrey's house. With no expression and with their head down. But we could tell she was very nervous. Question. What do you mean by distraught and shaking? What, what do you mean by that? Answer, shaking. I mean, literally quivering. Question, what happens next? Answer, we were again, the absurdity never introduced. Like you would walk into a room and say, this is... So my wife and I are in the kitchen and this young girl's sitting there. And it was a very uncomfortable moment. I look at my wife. And so I want to ease the moment. So I introduce myself and I introduce my wife. And she doesn't really respond. And I asked her, are you okay? And she doesn't really respond. Nothing verbal, no cues or head still down. And I asked her if she would like some water, a tissue, anything. And she basically doesn't respond. You ask her for a tissue? Answer, if she would like a tissue or some, some water at the time. Question, was she crying at the time? Answer, my perception, she was on the verge of crying. And I'm trying to loosen the situation every way I know how. So the only way I know how, and I thought maybe this will help comfort her, I said, oh, by the way, do you work for Jeffrey? And she says that, I guess, kind of made her feel comfortable because maybe it was at that comment or my persistence. And she said, yes. So I said, what do you do? And she says, I'm Jeffrey's executive assistant, personal assistant which from looking at her didn't seem to fit to suit. And so I blurted out, you're his executive personal assistant? What do you do? And she says, I was hired as his executive personal assistant. I schedule his appointments. And I'm shocked. And I blurt out, you seem quite young. How did you get, the, how did you get a job? How old are you? And she says to me, point blank, I'm 15 years old. And I said to her, you're 15 years old and you have a position like that. At that point, she just breaks down hysterically. So I feel like I just said something wrong and she will not stop crying. My wife and I are at a loss for words and I keep on trying to console her and nothing I was saying 
Are you all right? Do you need a tissue? Do you need water? Nothing consoles her. And in a state of shock, she just lets it rip. And what she told me was just unbelievable. What'd she say? Answer. She proceeds to tell my wife and I, and this is not, uh, this is blurting out. Not conversation, not a conversation like I'm having a casual conversation. That quickly, I was on an island. And on the island, there was Ghislaine, there was Sarah, and she said, they asked me for sex and I said no. And she's just rambling. And I'm like, what? And she said, I asked her. I said, what? And she said, yes. I was on the island. I don't know how I got from the island to here. Last afternoon or in the afternoon, I was on an island and now I'm here. And I said, do you have, this is not making any sense to me. And I said, this is nuts. Do you have a passport? Do you have a phone? And she says, no. And she says, Ghislaine took my passport. That's why he asked. That's me side telling you on the side. That's why David Boys asked, okay? And she says, no. She says, Ghislaine took my passport. And I said, what? And she says, Sarah took her passport and phone and gave it to Ghislaine Maxwell. And at that point, she says that she was threatened. And I said, threatened? And she says, yes, I was threatened by Ghislaine not to discuss this. And I was just shocked. So the conversation, and she's just rambling on and on again, like I said, how she got there, how she doesn't know how she got here. Again, I asked her, did you contact your parents? And she says, no. And at that point, she says, I'm not supposed to talk about this. And I said, and I'm, but I said, how did you get here? I don't understand. We were totally at a loss for words. And she said that before she got there, she was threatened again by Jeffrey and Ghislaine not to talk about what I had mentioned earlier about the word she used was sex. Question, and during this time that you're saying she is rambling, is her demeanor continuing to be what you described it? Answer, yes. Was she in fear? Answer, yes. Objection. Could you tell? Answer, yes. Objection. Answer, she was shaking uncontrollably. Question, what happens with this 15-year-old girl next? Objection. Answer, as she's trying to explain, and I'm asking questions because I'm, it says feared, I was probably scared as she, I'm as scared as she is at this point, we hear people approach and she shuts up. Question, what happens next? Answer, Ava comes in and tells her that she will be working in the sit for Ava in the city. So obviously, in my opinion, there's been some kind of drama that they're trying to fix it. That's what I can assume from this story. All right? So Ava comes in and tells her that she will be working for Ava in the city. Question, as what? Answer, as a nanny. Question, did you see this girl again? Answer, yes. Question, and when? Answer, on a flight, maybe a month or so, to Sweden. Question, what was the purpose of the flight? Answer, we were going to Sweden for the summer. Question, who was on the flight? Answer, the Dubin family. Question, as well as this girl? Answer, yes. Question, what happens? Answer, one thing I forgot to mention is during our initial conversation, I asked her what her name was, Blank, she said her name was blank. It's redacted, okay? What happened with redacted? Answer, we flew to Sweden. We stopped at an airport that we didn't usually stop at and she got off the plane. Question, just so that I make sure I understand who, who it was that she said asked her for sex on the island. Who was that? Objection. She didn't specify who asked her for sex. She said that they asked for sex immediately after she put Ghislaine and Sarah into that conversation. Taking her passport? Answer, yes. From, and then they, there's sometimes some stuttering. Are there any other incidences or occurrences that you observe personally with Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell? A objection. Answer, not that I recall. Question. 
This last event that you described, what's the time frame when that occurred? Answer, late 2004, 2005. Question, when did you resign your employment with the Dubin family? Answer, I think roughly October. Of what year? 2005. Why? Answer, my wife and I discussed these incidents and this is the and this last one was just we couldn't deal with it. That is the deposition of Rinaldo Rizzo. Allegedly he worked for the Dubins. Make of that what you will. It has been released. I haven't seen the press really hop too hard on that one, but boy, yeah, yeah. Now we had heard about this already through multiple drips and drops through the through the uh, the unsealing and different witnesses coming forth talking about this incident but to to hear the deposition of it is startling if they I don't know if they ever got a hold of this young 15 year old girl she you know now she she I don't know how old she would have been it was 2005 you can add 15 years she'd be out 30 give or take right 3031 now yeah my sympathies again are with the the victims of this and okay let's move on to the next document so the next document that we're going to talk about is the affidavit of Juan P. Alessi the housekeeper for 15 years at the Palm Beach house of Jeffrey Epstein there's also a deposition of John Alessi same fellow this affidavit originated from the Dershowitz defamation case, but it's in this, um, it was obviously filed also in this case, so it was on seal. This affidavit was signed on January 13th, 2016, again, about five years ago, five years ago, give or take. And I'm going to paraphrase these in some, unless he swears the following. He worked for Epstein between January 1991 and December 2002 as a maintenance man and then as the manager of the Palm Beach home. Massage was, quote, like a treat for the guests. He stated that the guests had their massages in a public area like the pool. There were between 50 and 100 masseuse. Okay, so that would be for Palm Beach. There's nuggets in between this rather innocuous affidavit. Think about that. Let's say you have a facialist. Let's say you have a dermatologist. You might have at tops two dermatologists, right? Would you have a <laughs> hundred? That's very, that, that's beyond the beyond. To have 10 would be extreme. To have a hundred at one residence on, you know, that you have on a list that you can call up when you need, when you need something. Yeah, that's crazy that he, he, but that's what he swore. Unless he claimed that he didn't know if any were under the age of 18. After the massages in Epstein's bedroom suite, he would occasionally find um, sex toys. And they're, they're more explicit, but I'm going to uh, leave it to the interested viewer to go and, and, and and look up the more salacious details. He did not find sex toys in the guest rooms unless it was Ghislaine's. I think he admitted later to finding some in Ghislaine's, but he didn't find them in the regular guest rooms. He says that Dershowitz came to Epstein's Palm Beach home between four to five times per year. He stated that he did not see Dershowitz doing anything improper. Again, this, this affidavit was from the Dershowitz um, lawsuit. So of course, it's seemingly supporting Dershowitz, but kind of throwing Jeffrey under the bus with the five, the 50 to 100 massage masseuses. He did give a list of celebrities that were at the Palm Beach residence or that he saw in his employment with, with Jeffrey because there was a question about, well, you know, did you see Redacted? And then he's like, no, but you want me to tell you who I did see? And the list of names would just blow your socks right off. So go look that up, all right? Because I'm almost scared to read some of the names. Go look it up. The Affidavit of Juan P. Alessi, January 13th, 20, 2016. Go look it up. He stated he never saw Virginia Roberts with Dershowitz. So make of that what you will. It made it into this file. It made it into this case and it was under seal. It's now been unsealed. 
The next document that I reviewed here is the deposition of Palm Beach Detective Joseph Riccari. I want to say this, guys. One, he's one of the heroes of the piece. So many times we talk about the police who don't do their jobs, p police that are slackers, police that cover up, police that, you know, they don't take the chance of doing the right thing, though it might be painful or detrimental. That's not this guy, in my opinion. And then he died, you know, kind of a sudden death. Yeah. He's the hero of one of the heroes of this piece, along with the, I believe, the victims having the bravery to, to come forward. That's in my opinion, that they're extremely brave to come against not only a billionaire, not only naming names of people who are in positions of power, but also maybe coming against what could be thought of as like a, a blackmail operation that's even bigger. So that's a, that's a brave person. But then again, Riccari's just getting victims from Palm Beach that are underage that come and parents are coming in saying, there's this guy and he, you know, my daughter went to his house. So he maybe didn't realize in the beginning what a can of worms was popping open. But once it popped open, he chased it down. And you've got to give credit where credit's due. And when the police do the right thing, you gotta you got to give them credit. you got to say, good job, because that is what you want. Riccari was the detective who performed interviews with many of these underage Palm Beach victims. He said that what his investigation revealed was the following that he found that Maxwell was involved in seeking out girls to perform the massages and the work at Epstein's home. That's what he swore under oath to. The 30 girls, give or take, that he interviewed were recruited for massage and that they had no massage experience. So contrary to what has been said, you know, that professional masseuses were invited or encouraged or asked if they would come over to Jeffrey's, that these not one of them had massage experience. And guess what? I got to say, what massage experience would a middle schooler have? What ex massage experience would a high schooler have unless they were emancipated? And then you would still have to have some training. I, it, it, it boggles the mind, the reaching that some people will do to try and deny. But let's continue. Joseph Riccari stated that each victim that went to Epstein home they were asked to bring their friends and that if the victim brought other friends, she'd be paid for it. His investigation revealed Epstein's assistants would call and set up girls to come over for massages. He also went on to say that essentially massage was a code word for sexual gratification, that some victims only went to Epstein's once and some came back more than once. He goes and talks about the pattern, if you want to call it an M.O., for the massages. So if you were gonna try to establish a pattern, it went like this. The victims scouted, the victims brought into the home, the victims taken upstairs, Epstein would typically lay on the massage table, um, his back and his, the back of his legs would be rubbed, Epstein would then fondle or make a fondling attempt on the victim, he would please himself, I mean, there's variations on the theme, but this is the general M.O. And then the girl will go downstairs and get paid. And there's variations on the theme. Sometimes it was um, more extreme and with more people. And sometimes, I believe, sometimes the girls balked. And I think one balked and ran out. I'm not sure. But most of the ones that came forward um, had that typical experience. The question to Riccari was, what was the criminal activity that you learned that Jeffrey Epstein and others were involved in? And his answer was, it was sexual battery and lewd and lascivious conduct for under the age of 16. Under the age of 16. Okay? Wow. I also want to say as a side note, now what we know, I speculate that this could have been a RICO issue. Or... Uh, or even bigger, but I don't know without looking, and I should have looked before bringing this up, I'm not sure what the statute of limitations is on a RICO, 
because we had planes, two different planes. We had the big one, Lolita Express one, and then you had the smaller one. And you have underage girls allegedly being flown over state lines to his different residences. The New Mexico one, you'd be, that's within the, you know, the states. You got New Mexico, you got flying to New York, you got, you know, flying to Oregon. They're dragging these underage girls you know, over state lines, if there's any kind of sex involved, we're talking Rico there. We're talking, you know, if you're giving them even for play, not charging a guy to, you know, you're giving them also to other people, not, you know, it's sex trafficking, but it's also like man act. You've got everything. I'm telling you, you've got everything. I don't see how initially once this thing blew up in Palm Beach, if they knew the scope of it, if they did know, which I don't know what they knew at that time, but if they knew the scope of it with the Jean-Luc Brunels and all the stuff that's going on in all these countries and the flying around, if they knew that, why they didn't go for a federal case is something I think needs to be looked into. That's my opinion, okay? I just want to say that we keep getting drips and drabs and I had tried to do this video yesterday. I ended up deleting the whole entire series. I did three hours worth and it just did not come out well. And we just keep getting more and more. There's other things that maybe I hadn't found before that were unsealed and then there's things that I still haven't read. And almost every document has something in it that's notable. For instance, in the deposition of John Alessi, okay, and this was taken on June 1st, 2016. I guess that's also Juan Alessi that I mentioned before that was from the Dershowitz case, but this is in the Maxwell case. He talks about MindSpring, and I think I might have even, I think we might have even used MindSpring maybe back in the 90s or something, but it's like you can have your messages on a server and it's on a computer and it it can go, the messages can be shared. And basically Epstein was using MindSpring to communicate with like even the housekeepers and the staff. And so every two to three hours, he would be messaging or calling New York where they had, you know, they were typing in crap into the MindSpring and then the messages would go out like kind of like via the computer. And he would be sitting there doing his job for as you know, I guess at this point he was probably the housekeeper at, or the manager at the Palm Beach house. And he says, quote, it got so ridiculous at the end of my stay, meaning the end of his tenure working for Jeffrey, that Mr. Epstein, instead of talking to me that he wants a cup of coffee, he would call an office, call the office in New York. The office would type it, send it to me in, in Palm Beach, okay? Jeffrey wants a cup of coffee or Jeffrey wants an orange juice out by the pool. So John would get an email notification. So in lieu of like just going to John, like going, being at the pool and calling him, you know, I'm sure they had the, the first cell phone or just yelling, hey, you know, Juan, bring me in, you know, a coffee. He would then call New York to type it up, put it on MindSpring, then MindSpring would give the notification to the computer and then Juan was expected to check it every so often to give Jeffrey the shit he wanted. I mean, it just, that's, that's beyond silly, but yeah. And then the next document that I looked at, the final one for today, and there's more, I looked at the composite exhibit in, filed in the Maxwell case that was unsealed. And there's a videotape deposition of Tony Figueroa. And he allegedly, I believe, is the guy that lived with Virginia Roberts for like six months during this time that she was initially being trafficked by Jeffrey. He said that Virginia told him, Maxwell, Jeffrey, and Virginia, seemingly, would go out to clubs to pick up girls to find them and bring them back for Jeffrey. Mind you, he's like her boyfriend, allegedly. And that Virginia was intimate with both Ghislaine and Jeffrey and other girls on multiple occasions. And that was his knowledge way back when it was first happening. It's against his interest to admit this. It's not something you want to admit. 
So it leans towards being true. Who would want to admit that? That you're like the ultimate cuck for money, <laughs> you know? Just saying, like, I feel for all these victims. But I just got to say, like, back in the day, if you want to doubt her, back in the day, her own boyfriend knew that this was going on. Or someone she lived with for six months. Make of that what you will. Before she went to live with Jeffrey. And he goes on to ultimately mic drop that Ghislaine Maxwell asked him if he had other girls to bring Jeffrey. So he, to paraphrase what he says in this video deposition that's reduced to a composite, is that when Ghislaine would call and he would talk to answer the phone, because think, you know, I'm sure it was a landline. Ghislaine would call asking, where's Virginia? You know, where, when's Virginia going to come over? And do you have other bring, do you have any other girls to bring over to Jeffries? That is what she was calling for. Get girls for Jeffrey. And we, and so, you know, you want to question whether she was the madam for Jeffrey or a, one of the many, Matt, you know, people that would recruit Young girls, I mean, you have witnesses. Do you choose to believe them? That's your, that's your prerogative. So currently, as of January 30th, 2021, there are some pre-trial motions before the court. We're leaving the defamation, the Virginia Roberts Jufre, the, the, you know, the settled civil case. Now we're going to talk about the current charges against Ghislaine because she's currently chilling in federal jail in New York awaiting trial on the sex trafficking and the perjury charges, all right? And right now there's quite a few pretrial motions in this case that are on the docket and one of which is Maxwell is seeking to get her case dismissed on the grounds of that the jury, oh, the grand jury in White Plains, New York, that's Westchester County in New York, that grand jury that was seated to indict her was too white. You have Miss Lily Whitebread, whitey, 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 arguing essentially that the jury that impaneled her maybe violated her her sixth amendment to you know right to diversity I, it'll fly in the sense of they'll look at it because you do have the right to have a diverse um group of people you know on a regular jury on a grand jury you have that right but it, it, it to me it smacks more of if you were a person of color or a person of a certain religion and not having a diverse jury or a grand jury, that would fly more than Westchester, guys. It's super white. In general, it's super whitey white bread. And Ghislaine is uber whitey white bread. I don't truly think you want a more diverse grand jury, Ghislaine. But you know what? You're gonna... There's some kind of chess move here that they want to play. They're arguing that that jury, that grand jury, lacked diversity under the Sixth Amendment. So they're arguing that that venue is wrong. But you know what, guys? If the indictment against Ghislaine Maxwell is dismissed, the state can and will impanel a new grand jury. And I'm sure she'll again be indicted again. And... I mean, it, the wheels go round and round and round. There must be some chess move that she wants moved, you know, she wants to be moved for some reason. Or maybe they're just trying to delay. Who the heck knows? The thing is, she's not getting out, so delays don't help her. But yeah, this this whole thing, this whole entire Epstein-Maxwell saga, in my opinion, isn't just a small little thing. It isn't just a little Palm Beach thing or a little New York thing. I think everybody's starting to see that it's a bigger picture. Now, I'm not the type of person, I love a conspiracy theory. Don't get me wrong, I love a conspiracy theory. But I also don't believe that you can tie everything up and tie it all together. Like everything that went wrong in the world is tied to Epstein and some kind of one thing that ties it up. Sometimes you just got to understand that there's a whole bunch of scumbags in the world. I, I know. I, sometimes, you know, when people like say, 
there'll be a serial killer, like a valid serial killer that killed, like, say, three people. But then some folks like to make everybody that was in any sort of you know, driving distance of this person was killed by the same serial killer. Because I don't, maybe it makes them feel more safe or it wraps up a case and then they can put it away and say, oh, you know, that's done. That's all figured out. Now, sometimes it's more complicated than that. And to have the conspiracy be entire, you know, global over the whole entire world that there's one conspiracy and it all ties to Epstein, that, that's, that's malarkey in my opinion. Could it be something to do with one of our alphabet agencies having like another blackmail kind of operation? I think, I think that's a possibility. But to make it like it's bigger than that? No, I don't think so. So anyway, I look forward to hearing your comments. So leave your comments and your opinions in the comments section below. Again, I want to say I am sorry that I'm filming from a bed and talking about these kind of issues. I know it is not is not ideal at all, but you know, COVID. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate your likes. I appreciate your subscriptions and I hope that you're surviving. I hope you're thriving if possible. Actually, we're just barely getting by here. It is it is really tough, but you know what? There's always someone who has it worse, so I'm not going to cry and complain. So anyway, I appreciate you and have an excellent day.